Welcome to the Spacecraft Workplace Podcast, presented by Dan Moscrop. The Spacecraft Workplace Podcast is brought to you by them.co.uk and our partners, Women in Office Design and Workplace Trends. Today we've got Rosie Haslam, who's a director at Space Lab. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Space Lab? I think they're a really interesting practice because you come at things quite differently from other practices, I think. Yeah, hi Dan, first of all. Um, yeah, Space Lab have been going 17 years, and I think really from the very beginning, Space Lab were trying to do things quite differently. We're, we're an architecture studio principally, but um, now I guess we've morphed into kind of more of a, I guess, more general research and design studio. Really with a main focus on people and designing spaces for people, but from a very sort of data-driven, evidence-based background. So everything we design is based on um, really understanding the end user and what it is they need. So kind of designing from the inside out, yeah. so making things work before you even start considering the aesthetics. The aesthetics are obviously very important, but it's, it's really an approach that is about user-focused design and um, solving problems for clients. And you've got your partnership with the UCL as well, which is interesting. Yeah, so Space Lab started as an independent practice, right. but um, one of the, the founding partners, uh, Andy Budgen, he had been at the Bartlett and he'd been involved in um, the Space Research Group. And through his work with them, um, he sort of came to look at space very differently and his approach to designing space came again from this very people-focused, kind of looking at spatial configuration and what space can offer and how people use space based on how, how essentially how it's laid out. So you, you took quite an interesting route to getting into architecture or, or research. You started off with human geography, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I'm a geographer. Um, but human geography, and everyone always asks what human geography actually is, and it's, it's kind of everything. It, you know, it's, yeah. it's politics, it's philosophy, it's economics. But for me, it was very much also very spatial. Yeah. So I had a real focus on the urban geography side of things. I was really interested in cities, principally, and how cities worked. And that was what I thought that I definitely wanted to go into, was somehow in the built environment, but understanding space and how it works um, on an urban scale. So when I graduated from my undergrad, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but then I found a, a, a practice called Space Syntax Limited, and they were doing kind of exactly what I thought I wanted to do, hmm. um, but I didn't quite know how to get there, because it kind of looked like everybody was an architect who worked there. But when I looked into more about um, who they were and, and how they'd come about, they'd actually also grown out of this research group at the Bartlett. So they're right. effectively like an urban design consultancy, but they look more at... I guess expert advisors to architects, developers, uh, councils to improve the design for an, a part of an, you know, an urban development, yeah. really looking at how space works and how people will use it, then going on to even things like land use. Anyway, so I was, I was really interested in, in the work they did and it was very much, you know, it, to me it was very geographic, it was, it was geography, it was um, the social theory of space. So I ended up enrolling in this master's course at the Bartlett and um, through doing it I actually realised that half of the, the course was really focusing on architectural scale as well, so how buildings are created, mm -hmm. how they function in terms of their spatial configuration and layout. Even though I, I went on to actually work at Space Syntax Limited, the, the urban design consultancy for a couple of years, and then went into urban design and did a master in urban design, ultimately I actually um, have swung round and come back into architecture um, to work at Space Lab. And that was really, I guess, applying similar principles of how you understand how people use space mm -hmm. and apply it to you know, designing space, but really with a more of a focus on, on the end user and more access to you know, working with the actual users who are going to be using the space. I take it with space syntax, that was bigger scale urban design and you've really wanted to pull out that more into a, a smaller focus on people within a, a built environment, so within a, a building itself rather than the larger space, is that right? Well, I mean, I suppose that the work of space syntax is fantastic, it's across all scales and actually they also do do some, some okay. building work. Right. Um, you know, so we'd be looking at anything from a small urban square to the redevelopment of a whole city. You know, we look, did a lot of work on, on Jeddah and how you know, the city as a whole system works. All of that fascinating, but I think it was, um, for me, it was about then working more closely with the actual people who are using the space. And I, I guess so scale-wise, it's easier to work with that at the scale of a building, you know, to be at the client or actually to a lot of the work that's, that Space Lab do is um, workplace design. So it's sort of really dealing with an organisation. I think what fascinated me about that was bringing in organisational culture. Mm -hmm. So once you're designing a building for a certain organisation or, or business, there's, there are the cultural elements that go on top of purely sort of spatial function and spatial yeah. potential. So you're looking at how does a culture play out across space and what does that add to I guess the mix of 
of how you design it. I'm assuming that your connection with the masters at the Bartlett to Space Lab is Andy Budgin. Yeah, so Andy, um, when Andy was studying, he did his sandwich year um, at the Bartlett and was part of this research group. So it was kind of a, a previous um, incarnation of what is now the master's course that I then did and that is still going. Oh, okay, right. Um, but through doing that, he had an ongoing relationship with the Bartlett and once Space Hub was set up, he sort of continued that relationship and, and that way of thinking and started applying some of the thinking to the way that Space Lab were designing spaces. So very much thinking kind of from the inside out, mm -hmm. looking at a space and challenging essentially the, the brief from the client. So not taking a, a client brief at face value, saying actually we're going to challenge some of your assumptions, we're going to validate them through delving into them a bit yeah. in a bit more detail, yeah. both through quantitative sort of data analysis, but also qualitative. And so that relationship was ongoing. Um, and then we started setting up some knowledge transfer partnerships with students at the Bartlett. So the first one was with um, now Dr. Kirsten Saylor. So when she was doing her PhD, she um, was looking into organizational culture and spatial layout. Mm. And so she was applying her research on our live projects to collect more data. And that became the basis of um, some of our methodologies, really. So she then ultimately, having having set up, a, a, I suppose, a toolkit of, of various um, bits of research, she's now full-time academic. So she was actually um, she's now a reader at the at the Bartlett, but mm. she was one of my tutors when I was there. And again, that that's what opened up to me this kind of idea of also applying this this thinking on, on a on a building scale. Mm. But the relationship is ongoing, so we still are very much um, still engaged with the course. I lecture on the course every year, um, and we we co-fund various bits of research, so we sort of fund a prize every year for the students, um, and we've got another current um, PhD student, so I'm co-supervising um, a student who's, again, using Space Lab data, but, right. you know, he's got the luxury of four years, well, luxury for some, um, luxury of sort of four years to delve into it in a way that we perhaps don't have in practice, but it was a weird sort of... Uh, so it so really he's, benefits both parties. Yeah, so he's, he's really, you know, interrogating all the data and finding new, new mm. avenues to research in it, um, which is... Of course, it's fascinating for us, but um, it's great that he can apply his academic mind to it. So that's kind of how the relationship um, still exists and is, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds really interesting. I mean, because from, uh, from a graphic design point of view, which is my law lowly standpoint, oh, you sort of <laughs> look at the, um, but you look at data and it, so it almost feels quite cold and difficult for me to interpret and understand. Whereas... Because from my, my experience of organisational culture, it'll be something I'll go in and I'll experience and I'll mm. see. So how do you unpick something like organisational culture from data? Well, I suppose well, the first point on that is how cold is data? I mean, data, there's kind of been a real, um, data has become the key thing at the moment, hasn't it? Everyone's it like, it has, yeah. Everyone, yeah. But yeah. then I think there's a real um, danger of collecting data for data's sake and just sort of, I mean, yeah. you know, we've got reams and reams of data. So, our, so one stream of work at the moment is for us to actually try and harness a lot of the data we've collected over, over 15 years mm. and actually sort of derive even more meaning and, and value from it and set further yeah. benchmarks and, and identify, I suppose, further areas for research. So, you know, let's, let's look at all of this data. We're um, comparing it, bringing out new research problems, I guess, that we can, that we can look into more. But I think the key, um, the key aim that we have when we're trying to collect data for clients is is sifting out what is actually valuable and yeah. kind of you know will actually have meaning for them. So we collect huge amounts of data, um, but I guess our skill that we're able to offer is to say, okay, well this is what actually has some meaning, and then the layering of data. So there is a, a lot of it that is very quantitative, so that's, yeah. you know, numbers of, um, particularly on things like occupancy, mm. and, and you know, numbers of people in various parts of a building, but the qualitative side is kind of just as important in terms is of Is that like interaction layering. and how people... Yeah, but also our engagement space. with users. So right. the quantitative right. is one element that shows us sort of a very hard picture of this is what's actually going on, yeah. but the real key is to really engage with users and understand from their perspective and, and unpick that culture I guess through speaking to people, and then mm. there's a, a big side of it as well, which is just about kind of immersing ourselves in the space. So I think you know, from your perspective, understanding that brand and culture, it's it's actually just being there, just feeling the stuff that's mm. going on. You know, the nuances that add meaning to to the quantitative. You know, so you can get data of how is the space being used, but it's. It, could look like an anomaly or it could look like nothing but until you're there in the space and you're understanding okay well that's why we're seeing 
this usage in this part of the building or mm. in that area or, or, or nobody's using that. Why is that? And until you're there and you can feel the space mm. or feel the culture and there's a reason why and actually is there a big sort of sofa outside the CEO's office? Well, that's a reason why no one's going to sit down and have a cup of tea because it's a direct view of the CEO. So it's all of those kind of extra things and, and, and then far more complex. It's those real nuanced bits of sub-team culture as well, which are, which are fascinating to unpick. Because we, we um, I looked at doing an app a while ago, which was like an occup uh, occupational psychology app. Um, and we were we obviously kept hitting this brick wall of people being really paranoid that, you know, it's a bit big brother and, and I, are you going to track when I sit down and whether I come into work in certain days? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a common... Um well, I guess it's a, a common fear. So I think sometimes when we first bring up the idea of an occupancy study, again, whether it's in a workplace environment, in a you know university environment, healthcare, whatever, there's mm. there's immediately the fear, and especially in, I mean increasingly now the kind of data protection and, and, and people worrying about anonymity, etc. But I mean, I guess the first part of course is to say you know, why are we doing this? It's it's all for it's good intent. It's to understand how a space is being used, for, mm -hmm. hopefully to deliver better value and a better space for the people using it. So it's not um, you know, we're there to help ultimately, but it's also you know the data is all anonymous. So we're not we're not looking at you know, we're not going to say oh is Dan sitting at his desk today or oh, where is he? We're we're building pictures of overall usage of space. Mm -hmm. So we're. Um, you know, of course, if you delved really far into it and we knew exactly which workplace, you, work point that you have to be sitting at, we would know where you were across the day. But again, we anonymise that before we share it with the clients. And I suppose there's quite fluidity now at work. You've got Agile and everything coming in, so no, no one's actually sat at their normal desk anyway. So I'm sure that helps your data, I would have thought. Well, um, so I mean, I suppose a lot for the workplace projects that we do, a lot of the clients, when we're first dealing with them, they mm. they are in a more traditional setup, so kind of everyone having their own okay. desk allocated, right. and they're not being a lot else, really. So quite static, more traditional setups, but but the way that everybody is going is more towards an agile setup, much more flexibility, much more choice. And I think, you know, it's not to say that a desk is bad and a you yeah, know, yeah. A, a high bench laptop working is is good all of the time. It's about really understanding what does an individual need, what do teams need, mm. um, and how does that fit into the kind of organisational strategy, really. So by providing a variety of all of those things, people can choose depending on the task they're doing, depending on their mood, and just depending on their personality preference. Some people will always prefer to work at a certain type of work point, and mm. some people will change by the day or by the hour. You guys are kind of best known for workplace design, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, we are, and I think that's and that's been fantastic. You know, we've had some really amazing projects um, in the workplace realm over the years, and developed some really great ongoing relationships with big, you know, anyone from Virgin Virgin across all of their different groups. We've worked mm. with them a lot over the years. Um, just completed some really big projects for Warner Brothers, so their big yeah. HQ in London. That must be fun. Yeah, mm. fascinating. Um, obviously, there's loads of they've got loads of content to yeah. also kind of try and showcase in the space, but also had a. A very interesting culture to, to look into, um, and then ASOS is HQ. So we've just that's yeah. quite a mammoth one in uh, Mornington Crescent. It's been ongoing for a few years, so that's just completing at the moment. They're really large scale, but then we do everything down to you know smaller scale, a few creative agencies where you're then looking at similar issues of bringing to life organisational culture and you know helping people do their best work. But on a smaller scale, you know the d design options are. Are different, but again, it's also about the, the brand. So, how do you really work with the brand and bring that to life in different ways? We've also done work with Houses of Parliament, a much more sort of public sector, and, oh, and wow, some of that those things. Interesting too. Yeah, so that was more a, a research and strategy piece, really, uh, informing some of their ideas around the restoration renewal program. Yeah, yeah. So again, just really helping them understand Cause that's how it, people uh, work. I, I think that's really exciting in that such an old building to sort of try and unpick how that's been used and how it should have been used, you know, because the intent back then must have been so different, obviously. Yeah, and the way that, you know, they've grown and, and keep growing and departments move yeah, and yeah. space not really designed for, you know, huge workplace, but also just shifting some very specific working requirements and, you know, a chamber. How is that temporarily moved and accommodated in a different building and mm. with a with a short-term use so that you're thinking well how is that going to be what's the sustainability perspective how is that going to be used after they move back um, into the Houses of Parliament what else can you use that space for that you've created a very specific chamber for them so mm. no that was interesting in, in its own ways but yes yeah, so, so predominantly have been have become known for workplace design um, which has been fantastic but really 
you know, we are a creative design studio with a, mm. with a research sort of um, drive behind us. So really we're able to apply those skills and that approach on any scale, any um, type of design really. So we've, we've gone into um, you know, retail, hospitality. Well, we met at Borden, didn't we, um, in North Acton, which was, has a really interesting story to it as well, I think, that to be careful, but North Acton isn't the most beautiful place in the world. Up and coming, uh, there's a lot of development the there at the moment, Dan. Um, <laughs> and, and Borden were up there, and mainly because they had a huge warehouse, and, and when you go there, it's like an oasis, it's, it's a beautiful space. That it is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't so, when we first got involved in the project. So, so tell me about that then, what, what was it like, I mean, what, were the, what was the reason you were getting involved with Borden? Well, Borden, um, big British fashion brand, um, for anyone who doesn't know them, predominantly now an online retailer so they're kind of a fashion tech company actually but they grew um, as, a, as a British brand and they grew in this home in, in North Acton and originally they were in a kind of a 60s office block it had a sign outside saying ugly building beautiful clothes I mean it was a really <laughs> really ugly building Embrace it. Yeah, yeah. On, on a big main road and yeah. um, sort of tall well, four story, but very thin floor plates. A few years ago, they came to us because they were having to move because HS2 was, mm -hmm. was going through their site. So they, they had to leave. And we'd done some work with a couple of other fashion brands. And they, so they heard about us and came in to see us and said, actually, can you help us understand you know, what the, what the future is for, the, for our way of working? How can we work better in future? And come up with a brief to actually help us find a new building, a new home, and, and can you get on board? So we did quite an... Uh, prolonged piece of engagement and analysis and really understanding how we could optimise a way of working for quite a complex company in terms of dealing with product, you know, fashion. I sort of imagine they're quite like a, almost a bit of a family oriented, you know, like a family business to a degree, you know. Well, they are. I mean, the founder, Johnny Bowden, is still very much driving it, you know, mm. amazing character, and he, he's still very much there and, and part of it, and he had a real vision for how he wanted to, to run things and interact with things, but also, you know, a fantastic um, leadership team as well who who were, were co-driving it. But that feeling of family was definitely lost through um, being spread across these very siloed floors. So these mm. you know, four floor points, they actually had kind of a, a site down the road as well to, to accommodate some of the overspill. But overall, I mean, I'd say it's more, not even just the floors that prevent people seeing each other. I mean, people are just drowning in clothes. And um, you know, th their big thing is product. So not only were we coming up with a new way of working for people, but it was really coming up with a way of managing product through this building. So samples come in, they're being designed, different, you know, they're being, they're being changed, being passed between designers and, and buyers and you know you're trying to look at different seasons you have a storage issue of multiple seasons of clothes that you want to be able to compare and reference back to so quite a chaotic um, situation when we first got involved. I think you mentioned also that they'd have to pop out to cafes for uh, meetings and things like that. They just had no real space to right. come to come yeah. together really so it was very desk space but again just surrounding product so the first part of our work was really understanding okay well how can we optimize all of that rationalize the storage and um, focus a process that is all around dealing better with, with product. So we came up with sort of some requirements. We we informed their property search. We went on you know, a load of different property tours. We're looking at them, trying to understand which would best host them, their processes, but also their people and kind of the big cultural change of moving out of North Acton, which for some was a positive, but really looking at what buildings would work best for them. During that process, the alignment of HS2 actually shifted by a few degrees. So their, their building was no longer at risk of, of being yeah. knocked down. So by this point, they were quite keen to, to carry on leaving because actually they sort of found some new shiny buildings and thought, actually, that's much, that'd be mm. much better for us. I think they were fed up with this, this crumbly old 60s um, office block that was, as I say, quite ugly. But we said, well, hang on a sec. If you were to stay, you've got this huge opportunity because they had a huge warehouse at the back of the building, right. which had originally um, held all of their clothes. In years gone by, they'd moved all of that operation um, to a warehouse in Leicester. And so this space was just sitting pretty so much got empty. Huge floor space. I, I mean, floor, huge, floor plate, yeah. absolutely massive. You know, triple height space, um, huge footprint, and it was had a bit of old storage that didn't really need to be there, but it was used because it was there. And did a few photo shoots there, but but really, it was completely underused. So we tried very hard to, <laughs> to come up with ways with, with, with telling the story as to what this space could be. So we used a lot of the tools that um, were developed in, in collaboration with UCL, so sort of spatial analysis tools, heat mapping tools, to model the impact of opening up this space and connecting mm. it with the front building. So we were able to show them actually look at the fantastic space you could have if you were to stay. And you, you guys 
do design slightly differently as well to other architect firms that I'm aware of. Although you've got this really strong research and strategy aspect to it, a lot of your di design is done directly into Revit. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. So it's a that's VR right. experience from the start. Which is, yeah, completely, which is, which is the natural extension of the kind of very research, user-focused um, approach. So the way that we work, um, and you know, Revit isn't revolutionary, lots of architects are using Revit. It's certainly transformed the way we work, but it's it's kind of the way that we harness that, I think, mm. is, is slightly um, I think it seems like the, the, the level of detail you put into it and the fact that you continue to design through it seems to be the different approach. Yeah, so we're using it, A, to design, so being able to design in, in 3D, has, has really transformed, I guess, the, the quality of the detail. So everybody within the studio is able to to really understand the full detail of, of what we're designing again, mm. rather than just looking at 2D plans. So everybody's on the same page and we can understand um, how it's going to work out in, in three dimensions, because of course what we're designing is <laughs> very much three dimensional. Yeah. Um, but the key way that we're actually really leveraging it is through it's a quite a simple plugin that you can just. Um, move your designs over into a virtual reality model. So again, both for us to look at internally, but the key thing this has enabled us to do is work with our users in a virtual reality environment. So mm. showing them the model and the designs as we progress. And that really is, as I say, it's a natural extension of of our research and our, our, our user-focused approach because we're taking those same users on the journey. So as soon as we start modeling some of our proposals into a design in 3D, we're able to share with them a very much a work in progress from the beginning, but mm. involving them in it. I was just thinking, because that must have really helped with Borden and get their vision to understand that this, this space that they see is this quite negative, big metal shed, I assume. I suppose with, with the project, it wasn't even that the, the, the shed was negative. It was just being able to bring to life your ideas. Yeah, I think it's yeah. one thing, you know, every, everybody will see a, a 2D plan very differently. And some people will understand it, some people won't. Even if you do understand it, you'll, you'll see it in a different way to, to the next person. So being able to show designs in three dimensions is kind of completely transformative. I mean, it seems actually pretty um, common sense. Hmm. but it's very different to the traditional way of working. But then the key thing, I think, is being able to design then with the users as we go. So, of course, as I've said, the, the approach is very much about identifying problems from the start, so really getting under the skin of a business and, and what they need, and, and every person's individual you know, role and, and way of working and kind of you know, a day in the life, what, what are their pain mm. points along their sort of user journey of, of working in a workspace then being able to say, okay, well, have we solved this problem? So our design researchers and our designers are going back in as we develop the designs and saying, okay, you told us this, this was the issue that you brought up, this is how we're thinking that we can help help mm. you with that problem. Mm -hmm. Does this work for you? And so the user is immersed in the space with sort of testing out the very problem that they've mentioned in the first instance and seeing whether that works. And once we've honed it potentially so we, we deal with their feedback we iterate on the same design we come back to see them every time we come back to see them we're laying on a bit more detail so in time you're then also layering in you know the look and feel and mm -hmm. bringing that to life ultimately you have you know the, the the furniture that you're specifying is also built into the model as well mm -hmm. so by the mm -hmm. end you have a fully detailed model that has every everything in it so it should look exactly like the final final design will be so not only are you moving on the design process you're also engaging people as you go. So actually from a change management perspective as well, it's, it's invaluable. So yeah. everybody is taken on the journey as opposed to you know, seeing something however many months later and yeah. having all of the surprise that I could come with that. I think that's it. You also mentioned that there's no value engineering required as well because the Revit model is constantly keeping up to date with everything, which is well, obviously yeah. really valuable. It's, yeah, it is. I mean, I think both from a... I mean, a, a saving time as you go perspective, but also again that kind of the change of management in the sense you're not you're not losing all those things that you've mm. designed and everyone's everyone's been hoping for, and then it comes to the very last minute and you realise that actually that's out of budget and, and, mm. you, and you've got to yeah. you've got to design them out. But but I think what the model also does so as I say, it's valuable internally for designers, really valuable for working with the users, yeah. but then also fantastically valuable for working with other consultants. So yeah. the cost um, consultants can be on board from the beginning, working with us in the Revit model. So as we make small changes as we go, they're adding that into their cost model as mm -hmm, they go. Mm -hmm. And so there's no surprises. It's not like we can... It, I guess it takes down a very linear process into you know, this much more iterative 
approach for everybody involved. So everything is small changes as we go. It's kind of a real openness to, you know, we're in this together, we've got work in progress, let's all solve it together. Mm. So yeah, no kind of big milestones where you sort of, the ta-da moment of the big <laughs> reveal, and then... And we love that as creators, don't we, let's be honest. <laughs> well, da, 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 da. well, like well, <laughs> well, exactly, <laughs> until then you're faced with a, hmm, no. And then you realise yeah. there's no time in the programme to go back and yeah. redo it. So you're, you're capturing those things as you go. I mean, essentially, it's, you know, it's very much actually learnt from the tech industry of, of sprints and cycles. I guess with the idea that you, you, know, you fail fast. If, if there's something not going right, you nip it in the bud and you, and you yeah. kind of redirect yeah. the design or you redirect the, the approach very, very quickly and ultimately come up with a, a better result, really. And talking of good results, we met on Borden. We had our first initial chats there. Um, and there's a little little bit of hero worship for you. I noticed everyone's like waving at you and saying, hey, Rosie. So you, they, re they really do acknowledge that what you've done there, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, well, I think, well, that's, I guess it comes back to what I said at the beginning about that real building of relationships. Yeah, so we yeah, are there as, there. as a, a part of the team. We involve them and, and we hope that they value us as as a key player in evolving their you know their business and their culture so i mean Bowden was was lovely and we actually ended up um doing a video of, of the of the end product really but but the, the video wasn't a, just about the space it was about one of the well, many people that we worked with there but a girl called cordelia we sort of followed her through a day and really we wanted her to tell her story because we felt that that is the story of the project is yeah, well she's yeah. one of many people there and one of many stories but it for us it was a way of illustrating that this space is for those end users and and that was actually stemmed from <laughs> from a moment where she she went up to our fantastic client there who we work really closely with um robin she she said thank you you've, you've changed my life wow you couldn't get better feedback than that you could couldn't you? i mean it's pretty <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's pretty high praise, but but I mean that's real. That's what what we are doing, and that's what um, designing space is really about. It's you know, if people are living in these spaces every day, you know, let's let's value the the potential that that can have. Just going through a little list I made of, of the things that you did there that, that were the solutions. You you created zones. Uh, you became much more product focused. You created a big auditorium so they increased the visibility. Yeah, so it was just really. Again, so it was opening up the whole space. Their, their mm. key challenge was that they had these really siloed floors. Nobody was interacting across the business. You know, they, they obviously, they're, they're, um, what they're selling is clothing, but it's being driven by an online tech mm. team. So their mm. sort of tech team was very, very separate from their design team. Even their different design teams were very separate to each other. So how could they build a better range that was that was more coherent across men's, women's, children's, you know, even different parts of the Just whole women's Connecting everything connecting up Connecting everyone, right, yeah. um, working more, more, you know, the designers and the design teams, the product teams working more closely with the tech teams who are effectively selling it, the marketing yeah. and brand teams who are putting it out there. So overall, just bringing everyone together and people being able to understand what's come before in terms of those product ranges. So, so what we design is basically a concept which was around the product. So product, mm -hmm. Is, is why they're there, it's, it's, their, it's their purpose. So actually the, the whole space was designed around product and how product moved through the building. They were grouped in, as, as you say, sort of zones of, of different teams, but, mm. but they were mobile and agile within that and then across the building. Um, so they would rotate around these, what we called range rooms, um, where their product was there, it was on display, it was very visible, everyone's be able to see and, and very much feel the things that they were designing. But they were also then able to see and feel what everybody else was doing. So this mm. huge central um, auditorium space in the middle. And almost like gantry around the outside, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, so mezzanines built, and yeah. um, so this was the, the huge double height, or triple height and um, warehouse space mezzanines built around the edge so that everybody can kind of look over everyone's working around this central area and yeah. um, Johnny Bowden who we mentioned earlier um, founder he had this vision that he wanted to be able to bring the whole organization together with, in under a minute and li in this space he could you know you could stand in the middle they were everybody. actually starting that when we left yeah, actually, where yeah. Like, getting the wine out. yeah exactly and that's quite a common thing as well so, so I think it's also about looking at um, how a space works through time so this mm. central central heart of the building is really really is the beating heart and that's the space where of course everybody comes to eat lunch but throughout the rest of the day it's animated by people meeting eating having a break having a coffee working that evening was one of many sort of they have team drinks they have company parties yeah. they have, have all their fashion shows there so they sort of put a big catwalk down the middle mm. every time they launch launch the new season so a space that really serves so many purposes so it's a huge space but it's it's not lying dead at any point in time i think uh, one of the interesting Bits of data that, well, not data so much, but the one of the, the, the uh, results uh, that came out of the work was 
email being down 50%, yeah. which is phenomenal. I hate email. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but you know, this, it's all about communication and interaction. So yeah. actually, by, by opening a space up and seeing people, you know, I guess based on the principle that you tend to move where you can see. So mm. you can see mm. your colleagues, you know where they are, you're going to go and speak to them. So rather than sending an email, you actually walk to speak to them. Also, by, by being in this open space together, you're naturally bumping into more people. So actually saving the need to even send the email in the first place, you already bumped into someone and start that conversation. Mm. And then, of course, providing the spaces to go and have that chat. So, you know, where do you position yeah, different yeah. areas to sit down just off the main circulation route? So there's a lot of kind of people bumping into each other as they walk past each other on the stairs. Oh, let's just grab a cup of tea and have that chat now rather than trying to schedule in a meeting in two weeks' time at the first time you can book a meeting room. So really just breaking down those barriers and just encouraging interaction and collaboration. It is a lovely project and you can find that on spacelab.co.uk, I assume. You can indeed. indeed. <laughs> Good um, luck. Yeah, nice little project. Why not? Actually, I, the video, the video I is also online there it's, and that's kind of quite a nice way of explaining the experience for, for someone in, in the space. In a minute I want to dig into the sort of the new tech that you guys have been developing because I think that's really interesting but there's also another world of stuff that you're doing although you're really well known for workplace there's you've obviously done private healthcare but I thought Goodwood was quite an interesting thing to talk about. Yeah Goodwood is um, to Goodwood Estate which is in Sussex it's that's been a again a really ongoing client over the years we've done many different projects there but it's fascinating because there's kind of always a new a new work stream, as it were. So Goodwood Estate has a number of different um, activities that it hosts, I suppose. So they've got... The Revival Festival. The Revival Festival. They've got a number of festivals. Yeah. So they've got um, the Revival Festival, which is all about vintage cars. And that's what they're best known for, isn't it? The vintage car well, I, festival. Well, maybe that's why. Maybe, what, maybe. Are you a vintage car fan? Well, I, 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 well uh, John Yeh is a, a friend of mine, and, and he's very much a vintage right. car fan. He's or got a vintage a lot of clothing things. fan, because actually when you um, you go down no, there once... I you, don't do the no? steampunk. <laughs> well, if you go to the festival, the idea is that Do you, you dress up, but yeah, right. well, you don't I won't be going there. <laughs> But they've got all these different offers. So they've got this sort of car racing and car track. And they've also got a horse racing area, which is where we've been quite involved in recent years. Anything from, we've done bits of hospitality there. So looking at sort of champagne bars mm -hmm. and, and, and different bars and restaurants and some of that offer. But we've also really tried to understand how the whole system works there as, as, as an event. So we're looking at a master plan and sort of re revising how that the whole space is laid out and how people use it on, on race days. Is so, use of floors and where people are moving to? Yeah, or very much so. Yeah, all of the above. But, and also looking at then expenditure. So how does this system as an event really work? So you know, ticketing there, access so there's different different tickets you can buy depending on you know where you want access to this VIP and anything down to much more public and what we've been looking at is movement flows and how people are able to circulate the various stands access kind of the front row and, and view the actual horse race itself but also understanding it's about much more than the horse race there's actually it's actually a whole day event so how can we activate the rest of the site when it's not just the horse races going on. So there's sort of currently these very strong flows of people that rush to the front every however many minutes mm -hmm. it is that the, the horse race happens, and then immediately after, they, there's kind of a circuit, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, piss, pint, punt. You can. So we'll put a little explicit take okay. on it. <laughs> oh, you can bleep me I, out. I get one anyway for some reason. It must be my northern accent. Well, the, so everybody goes, they watch, they watch the race, and then immediately after everyone wants to go to the WC, then um, go and get a quick drink, put a bet on and race yeah. back to the front to see the next race. So actually this, this very, I guess, repetitive flow of people that just currently is not supported by the way the space is laid out. Mm, mm. So we've looked at congestion flows and how we can open up various spaces to better connect everyone. But also the other key thing there is that people come for the whole day, but actually the race is only going on for a part of it. So we're looking at ways of opening up the rest of the site, providing other forms of entertainment, but also other mm. other experiences. I think you know people are really looking for much more experience when they go to events now. So that's been a, a key part of some work that we're doing with them this year. And, and a lot of that is driven by um, our new sensors. Okay, that takes us nicely to the tech. Oh, good link. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, we're developing a new sensor, which is all about understanding, again, how people use space. Mm. So there's a big occupancy element of it. Um, again, to be applied on a, a workplace um, scale in terms of you know, occupancy of different buildings. And that's really a natural extension of a lot of the work we've been doing over the years in terms of observation studies of, of workplace environments. Um, but it can also be applied on things like the Goodwood scale of external areas and, and how people flow in, yeah. in, I suppose, even mini urban environments. So what is that? Is it, is it effectively a movement centre or is it everything? What else does it do? Is it 
Yeah, so that, so that, sorry, there is one occupancy side of it, which is based on a heat sensor of identifying people and sort yeah. of a, um, a, a movement and heat profile, yeah, of where people move in space. Yeah. Um, it's also got a sustainability element. So we're looking at um, carbon footprints, we're looking at um, energy usage. Wow, okay. Um, and, and actually how we can pair up the occupancy of spaces with the energy that they're, they're using. So you can turn on and off parts of a building based upon um, how people are using them. And finally, there's also an air quality um, sensor within there as well. So we're able to understand the air quality of rooms. Um, so essentially also looking at healthy buildings. So this has been our main um, sort of, or our most recent foray into sort of looking at new tech and how we can use tech to optimize spaces and, and really empower clients to to keep monitoring their spaces. You know, we, we're, mm. we're here, we sort of design a space that we we think we, you know, we we want to design it to work for for the future, and there's so much we can do in terms of setting up sustainably, setting up to be, you know, to have longevity. But a key part of that is then empowering the users to keep managing it going forward. Mm. So how can a, a person running a building or running a space? keep on top of it and keep understanding what's happening, identifying any new issues that come up, and that's then a flag to, okay, let's look into that bit more. You know, th and th those unexpected things that happen in a live mm. space are actually the fascinating thing. So, mm. of course, you want a space to work as you intend it, but I think it's where those, those new things come up which are really interesting, but also an opportunity to just further optimise it. Because a space has a life of its own once we sort of leave and, and finish the project. I mean, in some yeah, ways, sounds interesting. the end of the project is actually then the start of, of a building's so life. leaving your, your clients in a really informed way to make their own decisions. Yeah, and to say, you know, we're still there. You know, it's a, you know we're yeah. there if they yeah. come back to us and ask us advice on, okay, what does this mean? This is this is happening in this part of the building. And, and that's, a, you know, that's a really lovely thing for us to be able to do is to go back and and still be involved in, in the further life of the building. But do you think this is the way things are going? Um, our office is the only thing that's smart in it is the lights which switch off whenever. But it's well, smart. Whenever, whenever you press yeah, the button. Whenever, whenever you go anywhere near it, basically, <laughs> it switches itself very off. Smart. You've got to sit very very still for a second or two and then it switches off. But well, wave your hands but, around yeah, every 10 yeah, minutes yeah, in the, the evening. Classic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, is, is this the way the buildings are going to go, do you think, in the future? So we've got this sort of smart technology seamlessly woven into it so we know what's going on yeah, all the time. I think so. I mean, and not. And again, not just sort of tech for tech's sake. I think it is, and that's when you know, tech does need to be really smart. It mm. really need to understand how the building's being used, but also how is that of value to the person running it. But mm. as I say, I think design, you know, we're inherently trying to design things to be as sustainable as possible in terms of flexibility. You know, we can, when we're designing something, we're always asking about well, what's your, you know, let's model the future of mm. where you as a client and you know, be it a, again, a workplace or whatever type of organization, and uh, the hospital, university, what's the future, what does the future look like, how do we design to accommodate for that future, but also always knowing that you can never fully predict the future. Mm. So we set things up as flexibly as possible, but that's then where the tech comes in to to kind of still be there on the ground for, for identifying all those other opportunities mm. that um, you might need to look into later down the line. Rosie, I think that was really interesting. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. Um, to chat. Great stories. Thanks very much. Thanks. You've been listening to the Spacecraft Workplace podcast presented by Dan Moscrop, brought to you by them.co.uk and our partners, Women in Office Design and Workplace Trends. We'll be back with another episode soon, so please subscribe and keep listening.